Good evening, everyone. We'll leave the projector on there. Uh, we're doing something different. We're going to be doing worship music uh, before and after the Bible study each week, uh, just because you need that pick-me-up. We all need that pick-me-up. So I welcome those who are here in person and those who are watching online, those who are watching on YouTube. Please don't forget to subscribe. Hit that subscribe button, notification bell, and give us some likes. Uh, so we're going to start by reading Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, and uh, let's read that. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word, and uh, it's so it, exciting to me i know the world runs to different things for excitement but just to open up your word the the, the maker lord our creator the the one who makes the bunny rabbits and the kittens and the flowers and all these things as, as we see them start to grow up and we see the little flowers starting to push up the tulips in front of the church each year you're faithful you keep everything going and why would we not want to read your mind, your word, and to see what you have to say. So we pray that you would bless this study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're up to Revelation chapter 4, okay? So we're finally out of the church uh, part of that. And so this is going to be Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, this is still our series, Tomorrow's Newspaper Today, part 29. We will go, uh, we're going to conclude with the Laodicean church. We're going to show you that little documentary that we have for each one of the churches. Then I'm, then I'm going to give you a sneak preview of chapter 4. And I have something special coming. Next week, we're going to do something a little different. Just because we're, we're going into a different part of the book of Revelation. The deep, heavy, it's completely different than Revelation 1, 2, and 3. What we're going to do is we're going to do a, a special study called Exposing Cults, the Occult, and False Religions. Uh, a lot of the false religions around the world, I have a big PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we're going to do that next week, and that's very eye-opening. You'll get to see what the movie stars are into, what people, what celebrities. There's a lot of high-end new... Uh, new religions out there all over the place and we're going to look into them and so you can spot them and, and you're going to be surprised and go wow i never knew that about this that and the other thing and all the different things some of them you would have heard of before uh some of them you've never heard of before so that's going to be a special uh just a little break as we go into the book of revelation so you want to really be able to be able to spot evil and, and false religions and things that look like they're really good, but they're not. Okay, but anyway, before we do that, let's, let's go to um, our news here on, and let's see what we have for this week, okay, for February 28th, 2024. Uh, uh, part two, Iran plans uh, for terror during Ramadan. Uh, that's an uh, Islamic holiday that's coming. Uh, Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas are trying to use Ramadan to inflame the region so as to achieve another Ox October 7th uh, disaster against Israel. Go up to the next one. Uh, Anti-Semitism, and, and I know we keep reading this, but it keeps going up, is reaching World War II levels, say Norwegian rabbi. Anti-Semitism in Norway is at its highest level since World War II. The rabbi of the country's capital of Oslo told Israel Television on Monday. Uh, okay, go up to the next one here. This is just a, a comment from the guy from the news organization that I get this from. Ticking towards doomsday, is the secular world counting down to the tribulation? As a lifelong student of Bible prophecy and a close observer of current events, I'm surprised that the rapture has not happened. So many signs point to the nearness of the tribulation and conditions described in Revelation 6, 1 through 8, with the release of the writers of the apocalypse. However, we still wait for the time when we will meet Jesus in the air. That's going to be really cool, guys. Next. Um, okay. Oh, go down there. 
a consequential year. And this is really interesting. I didn't re realize this. Remember what I said, and I'm not a prophet or anything. I just said something about 2024. Do you know that I didn't even know? 2024 is going to be the year that just about the whole world is having elections for new leadership. Okay? This is the year that it all, the whole world is going to change. Also, I just heard that the, the Pope is in the hospital. Uh, he has the flu, so keep the Pope in prayer. But that, that's interesting because if something happens to the Pope, who replaces him is going to be very important. Uh, so that'll be interesting that, that he's sick. So uh, anyway, a consequential year. Nearly half of the world's population set to vote in national elections in 2024. And as we know, our nation, this is going to be the most historic election in our history. And I don't think it's going to end well, no matter which way it goes. I think it's just going to be chaos. I, I think it's just not going to be a good November we, if we even have an election. We'll see. But let's read it. Although Americans should expect an avalanche of news related to the presidential election over the next 10 months, it is important to remember that other offices besides the presidency will be on the ballot, including, and this is in our own nation, 34 U.S. Senate seats, 435 U.S. House seats, 11 governors are going to switch, uh, legislative seats in 44 states. The results of these elections will have massive consequences for the years to come, okay? Uh, now, that's just the United States. Our nation is going to go one way or the other this year, okay? Radically, one way or the other. There's, there's no bones about it. This is the most historic. But the United States isn't the only country engaging in national elections this year, as at least 64 other countries will be choosing world leaders. That's unprecedented. It's absolutely unprecedented. The world is going to change this year. Uh, got some crazy stuff here. This, this is under the crazy news. Uh, they are creating incredibly bizarre new technologies for the dystopian world of the future. And this is coming, and this is going to be in the book of Revelation. We're going to get to this. We're living this, okay? Palm scanning. And guess where it's coming? Palm scanners are being deployed at Whole Foods stores all over the country. And once you are enrolled in the system, you will literally be able to pay for groceries by scanning your hand. I've seen it at where they go. They, you, have, it. they have it? Okay. Now what? I believe I had also heard that they were doing it in Disneyland. In Disneyland? Now why is that significant? Because the book of Revelation 13 says what's going to happen? A global government and you're going to be given a mark on your right hand. I'm curious to see what hands and on the forehead that you'll be able to buy and sell only if you scan. Forget about credit cards. You'll just be able to go boop, boop. There'll be a chip in your hand. So how would the writers of the Bible ever know about technology like that? It's fascinating, people. This is fascinating. Okay, the level of crazy in our society has reached heights never seen before. I think we know that. What happens to a society when the number of crazy people surpasses the number of normal people? That's a good question to let us know. Unfortunately, I think we aren't too far away from finding out. A survey was conducted last year, discovered that 90% of Americans believe that we are experiencing a mental health crisis right now. And I can attest to that. Okay, I can attest to that. In, in, in my friends that I know, neurologists, psychiatrists, therapists uh, that I'm friends with in my own practice, and the people in our, in, in our own church, people are mentally just collapsing, unable to cope with all that's going on. Oh yeah, the homeless people, they, 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 they're not getting the help they need and we have so many more people in the country. How are we going to help all these people? So someone's gonna to have to come and fix all this. Uh, I wanted to give you just a, a reminder of how does the Bible play all these things out? Uh, well, the next thing to happen on God's plan 
is the rapture of the church. Okay, praise God for that. And we're going to be teaching exactly what that is. I've got a bunch of videos and movies and stuff. It'll be cool. The Great Tribulation that, Matt, that uh, we read about Matthew 24, seven years will last. Now, these are all future things. None of these have happened yet. The rise of the Antichrist, okay? That's going to be a political leader who's going to do away with nations. There's going to be just one, one big world with one leader, one president of the world, okay? Some political guy, a young, very charismatic man, according to the Bible. And we're going to look at the characteristics of who might the, this political leader be. Is he alive today? Is he going to be born? Uh, I, I believe he's probably alive and doesn't know who he is yet. Uh, uh, but we will find out. We'll find out. Uh, after that is the Battle of Armageddon. Where's that? That's where Israel gets surrounded by the world that wants to wipe Israel off the map, it sounds like, today. Okay? Uh, that's the Battle of Armageddon at the Valley of Megiddo. Uh, I actually have a picture of the Valley of Megiddo on the computer. One day I'll, I'll show it to you again. Uh, so that's going to be like World War III. That's what that is. And the world is going to come against Israel. Uh, then we have the judgment seat of Christ. This is for believers who will be rewarded and they'll gain and lose rewards for their life in Christ. Then we have the second coming of the Lord. Okay, after, after the battle of Armageddon, Jesus returns. Then we have the kingdom age, a thousand years long. Then we have the great white throne judgment when unbelievers throughout history are going to stand before God. And God, God's great. He gives everybody a chance to give an account for their life. But if their name is not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, off they go. Okay. And then we enter into the perfect age, eternal. And uh, that's a little foggy. Uh, that's the very last part of the Bible, chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation. It's very interesting to see what's the future going to be like. The future, future, future. Very interesting. Let's go to the next one. Uh, I think we had one more here. Okay. Uh, what will people be like in the last days. Second Timothy chapter three, verses one through seven, uh, one through seven. It's funny. I just sent this to my friend. I have a lifelong friend, my best bud, John, that I, we went to kindergarten, no, first grade together. And we, we've been friends ever since he lives in Virginia and I've been sharing the gospel with him for years and years. And we were talking today where we were texting back and forth about what's going on in the world. And he's so just what's going on. And I said, John, I said, please, I want you to do something. Please read, right after we get off talking, read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And you promise me? He goes, yes, I promise you. And then after that, read Matthew 24. So pray for my friend John. Uh, check out what God knows that, uh, of what the end of the church age will be like. So this is how people are going to be. Lovers of their own selves, conceited, okay? Bing, did a point for that. Uh, covetous, scammers. Boy, do you have to watch? Everything is getting scammed. Your credit, I mean, everything is, is someone's trying to sell you something or hacking into your computer, to your account, stealing your information, personal identity. They have at the gas stations. Now they have these people setting up these things. When you scan for gas, they have these people who plug things in there that they get your they get your credit card information. Uh, they they're scamming the scanners. It's crazy. Boasters. We don't have people who boast and brag today, do we? Yes. The nature of people will be bragging, proud, not in a good way. Blasphemers. Anything they can do that's against what God says. Unthankful. A whole generation of people who are unthankful. They're not thankful for anything they have. Unholy, without natural affection, uncompassionate, a mother's normal love for a child, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, children's love for their parents, that will just go away and people just won't care for one another anymore. Truce breakers, okay, make a promise, break the promise, okay? 
How many people have you made a deal with and they, oh, you didn't write it down, sorry. False accusers, liars will be the watchword of the day. Incontinent. Now we think of that word about when you can't hold it in there and you got to go to the bathroom. But the Bible speaks of incontinence, meaning lacking self-control. There'll be a generation that people just can't control themselves. It's, I can't help it. I got to do what I got to do. They'll do whatever they have to do that makes them feel good. They'll be fierce, ready to fight. And, and we've shared in the news people who have been killed for parking spots now. You cut off. People will just kill you. It's, just, it's so sad. Despises of those that are good. The world will hate people who love God. Hmm. Traitors, fake, fake people. You guys haven't met any fake people, have you? Okay. Heady, I mean, meaning reckless, just crazy. Just go down 25 and drive around. <laughs> there is recklessness, boy. High-minded, thinking they are so smart, smarter than everyone else. This is, a, this is an amazing one. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of the Most High, of God. Having a form of reverence, King James says, godliness, but denying the power thereof. People will appear to be spiritual. I'm meeting a lot of spiritual people, and we're going to be talking about this next week. A lot of spiritual things going on, and you doing your spiritual thing, but they'll deny the Creator who made everything. Okay, there'll be a lot of spiritualism, but no reverence for the Creator. Uh, led away with the, with diverse lusts, They'll, people will just will be driven by the animal instincts. If I if I want this, I'm taking it. See you later. I'm going home with it. That's whatever they see, they'll take. Um, this is amazing. This is amazing. I think this is the most profound. This is what I wanted my, my, my friend John to, uh, to uh, read. He's a super intelligent guy, very smart, had a real powerful job. He's retired now. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Do we have people today who have been are more educated than any other generation in the history of the world, yet they don't know the truth about God. And continuing, how many people are going to college forever? Just like their whole life is just educating, educating. You got 10 master's degrees, but they don't have no common sense. Always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 is mind-blowing to me absolutely mind-blowing okay so i think after that we're going to be showing the video okay so this is going to be the video for the church of laodicea it's a little bit long and then i'll give you guys a quick overview of chapter four okay wi-fi radiation on this day of discovery, author and Cornerstone University President Joe Stoll travels through modern Turkey to the vast excavations of an ancient city called Laodicea. In the first century AD, Laodicea was one of seven churches specifically addressed in the opening chapters of the Book of Revelation, a revelation from the resurrected Jesus and received in a vision by the Apostle John. At the end of the first century, Christianity is facing mounting opposition in the Roman Empire. John is a prisoner on the island of Patmos for his faith in one God, which goes against the Roman Empire that embraces many gods, chief among them the Caesar of Rome. It is on Patmos that Jesus appears to John to send a message to the world, a message that is today what we know as the Book of Revelation. But to the first century church, letters of challenge and hope. Journey to the seven churches of Revelation, the letter to Laodicea, on this day of discovery. You see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. 
and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things that says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you were a first century Christian and you lived in Laodicea, you would feel blessed. This town had a booming economy. Planted on the major trade routes of its day, goods came from all over the world, made the marketplace rich and lavish. It happened to be the banking center of this region. Its textiles were beautiful and coveted all over the known world. And it had a corner on an eye set, the medicine to treat eye problems that people came from far and wide to purchase here. I guess if Laodicea were a modern town, it would have posh malls and expensive car dealerships. And the nice thing about being a Christian in this town, you probably had enough money to shop in all those places and buy whatever you needed. The influence was so deep that in AD 17, when the earthquake devastated this area, Laodicea said to Rome, thanks but no thanks. We don't need your help. We can rebuild this town ourselves. So, at the end of the day, this was a really good place to live. The farm lay in the sea was a really neat place to live. It had one big problem. There was no water here. The town was planted here to place it at the crossroads of the trade routes. And that was an advantage. But the water was a serious disadvantage. So what they did was bring water from a source miles away. They constructed a long avenue of these kinds of water pipes, and they brought the water into the town. Now, the challenge with that was that in the hot sun of Asia Minor, by the time the water got here, it was tepid, and it was lukewarm. Uh, it was kind of like your tea not being iced or hot. This room temperature is not very attractive. Worse yet, that particular water source was full of minerals, kind of minerals that flavored the water to make it taste awful. Even the remaining water pipes here, you can see sedimentation of these minerals uh, that made you, when you drank it, you want to just spit it out of your mouth. If you boiled your vegetables in that water, <laughs> would wreck your dinner. Uh, if you boiled water in your house, it would make your whole house smell from the steam. In modern day terms, if you had ice cubes in this water, it would wreck your lemonade. So the water was a horrible problem here. Unlike Colossi, the neighboring town, it got its water from the mountain snow melt. It was cool and refreshing and tasted wonderful. In modern times, you would have been able to buy, no doubt, bottled water, mountain pure water from Colossi. That's what it's like. And Heropolis, the other neighboring town, had 
these marvelous hot springs. The way to see it, it was sucked with really bad water. So now we can begin to understand what Jesus was talking about. He's saying to these Christians, you know, I wish you were like the hot healing springs of Heropolis, or I wish you were like the cold, refreshing mountain water in Colossae. But quite frankly, you remind me of your water, tepid and disgusting to the taste. In fact, it's kind of saying, you know, you make me sick, like your water makes you sick. Now, what a stern reproof. In fact, given what the other churches were involved in, like idolatry and sexual immorality and denying the uniqueness of Christ to be able to accommodate themselves in the society, I find this the strongest reproof of all. And I ask myself, what could it be that this church has done to elicit that kind of response? from Jesus Christ. What would warrant such a stinging reproof of these early Christians? Well, I've heard a lot of theories, so let's start with what Christ doesn't want to do. I think the most prevalent thought has been, I want you to be hot and on fire for me, but you're apathetic. I'd rather that you actually be cold if you had to be something than be lukewarm and apathetic. So get fired up and we kind of work ourselves into a revival frenzy and we want to be on fire for Jesus Christ. And I say I'm good with all of that. But that's not really what Jesus Christ means. He's after something a lot deeper and a lot more subtle here in the lives of these followers of him. Actually, Jesus explains exactly why he feels like vomit when he thinks of them. Because the next verse goes on to say, because you say you are wealthy, and you have prospered, and you have need of nothing. Which meant that really they didn't even need Jesus. They had plenty of money, and it excluded him from their lives. Back when I was a kid in church, we used to have this old song we'd sing, I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour, I need thee. I'm telling you, that was not in the way of the same hymnal. Uh, what they really needed was a better car and a nicer house and an office on a higher floor. And, and they had plenty of money to buy themselves all of those kinds of things. And their affluence had excluded Jesus from their lives. You can see why Jesus felt the way he did. It reminds me of what the Laodiceans said to the emperor after that horrific earthquake in AD 17, when he said, no thanks, we don't need your help. We have all we need. You know, the danger of affluence crowding out Jesus is an old problem. Back in Deuteronomy, God warned the Israelites that when he brought them into the Canaan land that was rich with vineyards and houses that they did not build and all of the affluence that they would find there, he said, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord thy God. It's an important warning, isn't it, though? Abraham, the father of the children of Israel, God made him a promise that he would be the father of a great nation. And that he would have a son, and that would be the beginning of the nation. Well, the son never came, and he became old, and Sarah became old, and then miraculously, God gave them a son, Isaac. What a gift from God, a promise. But strangely enough, God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac to him. Personally, I think that was kind of a cruel request. Quest is one of those things that God don't ask him to do that. But there was deep meaning there. Uh, one of the meanings is that uh, Abraham was traveling among the Canaanites, and their highest allegiance to their gods was to sacrifice their children on the altar to their gods. I wonder if God was saying, Are you willing to love me as much as these pagans love their gods of wood and stone? Maybe. 
But once Abraham takes Isaac and places him on the altar and raises the knife, and God says, stop, stop, I was just testing you. Now I know that you fear God more than anything I've given you. I think the test was this. Abraham, do you love God, the giver, more than you love the gift? That's the test for the lay of his sins. He had come to love the gifts of God more than the one who gave it to him. He loved the gifts more than the giver. And Jesus offers a stinging reproof for that approach to life. About a month ago, I had a very interesting experience. I had been asked to speak at the Arizona Governor's Prayer Breakfast, and it was quite an event. Uh, seated to my left was the Governor of Arizona, there were Supreme Court justices, and all the important people were there. It was a lot of fun. By contrast, three days later, I spoke at the Brooks Correctional Facility in Muskegon, Michigan. Now, Personally, as I went into the jail, I thought I felt more comfortable with those people in Arizona that I'm going to feel here tonight. It was their Sunday evening worship service. As I walked into the room, I was greeted with friendly handshakes and warm smiles and a few hugs by the prisoners. And I thought, wow, what an interesting atmosphere. And then we began to worship. I couldn't believe the singing. It was gripping. It was real. It was authentic. It was loud. It just took my spirit up to heaven with them. And I opened the word of God for them. And they all grabbed for their Bibles and eagerly opened them to the passage. And it seems to me like they were hanging on every word. Afterwards, meeting many of them, they encouraged me and said, thank you and what God has spoken to them. And, and I thought, this is really where I belong. These are my brothers. Some of them, about 20 of them, are actually involved in heavy theological study, uh, getting major degrees while they're in prison. And several of them came to me and said, when I'm done here, I want to go out and minister for Jesus Christ. And I was driving home and I was thinking, this is amazing. And several of these guys had accepted Christ in prison. And all they have is like a sparse cell, kind of not very good food and a prison sentence, yeah. and they love Jesus, and they're going deep with him. They have nothing, but they have Jesus. <laughs> it seems to me that was all they really needed, and the strength of their spirituality was compelling. Uh, we used to pray that God would release the Chinese followers of Christ from persecution. We got to communicate from church leaders of China saying, please do not pray that. Uh, what we really need is we pray that we will be faithful in the persecution. Because when we're under persecution, when we're impoverished for Christ, we thrive in Jesus Christ. It drives us to him. They're telling us now in China that the affluence is growing in major cities like Beijing, and Shanghai, that the churches there are weakened because the affluence starts to move Jesus out of the need for Jesus to the edges. I guess we're learning something from this letter to the Laodicean church. But what we really need is Jesus. And affluence might just get in the way. This theater is a symbol of the great affluence in Laodicea not because of its size, but because there are two theaters here. It's got it, 40,000 people in it. Ephesus, the world-class city, had 200,000. We only had one theater, bragging rights to the rich town. And those prisoners remind me of another thing. They remind me that if you have Jesus and his word, you really have all you need satisfaction and fulfillment and meaning in life. And if affluence pushes Jesus out to the margins, then you're kind of in a bad way, which is exactly what Jesus said to the way of the scenes. He said, you say 
that you have wealth and that you have prospered and you have needed nothing. But from my perspective, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And so today's wealthy, though from Christ's point of view, spiritually impoverished Christians at Laodicea, he says, come buy from me, come to my shop and purchase things you can't get anywhere else. Kind of like, you get a rush from shopping? Let's talk. Now, in their minds, probably, they would be thinking about this marketplace, the Fifth Avenue of their known world. And so he says, come buy from me gold refined by fire. They knew all about gold. This was the banking center. They had gold in abundance here. But he was talking about a different kind of gold. All through scripture, gold refined by fire talked about the character and strength of the person that was developed under pressure, under persecution, under trial, and under trouble. He said, maybe your stand for Christ here that would be more overt, would cause pressures on you. That would be fine. I want to build you as a person. You can't buy that in this marketplace. Let me make something out of you. And he also offered to sell them robes of white, which throughout Scripture always denotes righteousness. Well, come to me and let me clothe you in my righteousness so that you can have full access to a holy God when you are hidden in me. Or perhaps even the righteousness of how they live so that they can live godly lives without guilt and regret. They can't buy that any place else in Laodicea. Only Jesus Christ could give them that wonderful commodity. And then referencing the ISAB that they sold here, he said, And come to me and let me anoint your eyes with this ointment so that you can see. Blinded by their affluence, God wanted to open their lives to things they had never seen before, the treasures of his wisdom seeing the world and their wealth from God's point of view. <laughs> Let me take your blindness. Let me help you to see. Only he could give them that. Well, we always think, don't we, that the best things in life are free. You know, I'm not too sure about that. But what I am sure about is that the best things in life only come from Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus wraps this letter to the followers of him at Laodicea with what I think is a very compelling picture. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's the door of their lives, the door of their heart. He says, If anyone hears and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship and dine with them. And we need to get this straight that dining in those days was deep, intimate fellowship that lasted for hours. It's not like taking my TV tray into their living room to watch TV with my wife. So he's offering them deep, intimate fellowship with him. Now I think this can be taken in some different ways. I remember when I felt my need for Christ as a Savior, that I went to my dad and I told him that. He sat down and he opened the Bible to this invitation of Jesus Christ. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open your heart's door, I will come in. And I did that that night. Some of you right now may be hearing the knock at your heart's door. He said earlier in the church at Sardis that the identity and the claims of Jesus Christ were exclusive. But you need to know his invitation is not exclusive. He says, whosoever may come, knock at your heart's door, open it, I love you, I want intimate fellowship with you. Maybe that's what your heart is hearing for now. But there's another view of this. Actually, this is being written to people who've already received him, who have pushed Jesus out of their lives because of their wealth, because they really don't need him. 
I'm struck by the fact that these letters begin with this powerful image of Jesus Christ. The awesome, conquering, unintimidable Jesus Christ. And at the end of the letters, he's been marginalized by them. Yet humbly, on the outside, he knocks wide to the end. Do you hear that over the clutter and the noise of all the stuff in your life? And are you willing to believe that if you really have Jesus, you have everything that you need? The material stuff is simply a bonus, not a distraction. Would you be willing now to hear him? And to open your heart story to him, bring him into the center. You need to know that nothing satisfies like Jesus. And he's ready, willing, and waiting. I guess the issue is will you open the door? Granted, it's, it's tough to get your head all the way around the book of Revelation. Actually, you can get your head all the way around these seven letters. But there is a reoccurring theme that is the foundation of the whole. And that is that Jesus keeps presenting himself as the ultimate conqueror, the victor, that in the end, he wins. And why would you want to cast your lot with what seems good now, but in the end, loses. I remember teaching the book of Revelation and these letters to a group over here at Asia Meyer. And I, I told them that. I said, well, I know what Revelation is all about. It's about the fact that Jesus wins. But we were on the Isle of Patmos, and one of the ladies was in a jewelry shop. And she was looking at different pendants. And there was a pendants with a cross and Greek letters in the quadrants. And she said to the shop owner, she said, what does this mean? And the shop owner said, oh, it means Jesus Christ, the victor. Jesus Christos, Mita. She said, you mean Jesus wins? He said, yes, that's what it means. He said, after Christianity had taken the Roman Empire, the Christians wore these pants. Well, needless to say, everybody else on a trip was looking for jewelry like that too. But at my next birthday, my kids gave me a ring, this ring that I wear every day with the cross and the words, Jesus Christ, the victor. It's a constant reminder to me that no matter what the challenges are in my life or what happens in my culture or in my world, that in the end, Jesus wins. It gives me courage. That thought gives me confidence. And it was that thought that gave confidence and courage to the early Christians. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow, that was a great one. That was the best of the seven. So put the lights on for a second. I'll leave that projector on. And what we're going to do here, we've got a couple minutes left. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 4. We're just going to give you a quick preview of what's coming up. And then we'll close with the song. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Because this is where it really starts to change. So... Now, this is John on the island of Patmos. Uh, after Jesus told him about the seven churches, this is what happens next. Now, I'm just going to read it through tonight, but we're going to go back and we're going to pick this through in the weeks to come and explain every single thing. So, after this, I, John, looked, and behold, the door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat on a throne. Talk about transportation in the blink of an eye, space travel. He's in the throne room of heaven. And he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow 
round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So John has seen the throne room of God. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire, lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We're going to talk about what the seven spirits of God are. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. You can almost imagine this in your head. And in the middle of the throne, round about the throne, there were four beasts full of eyes. Now, this gets really weird and very bizarre. So he sees these four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had the face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Those are angels. That's what they are. And when these beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. So Jesus is sitting on the throne. These four and twenty elders fall down and worship him that lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne. That's where the band, Casting Crowns, that Christian band, this is where they get their name from. Casting crowns, their crowns, back to God. We're nothing. You're everything. And they said, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for, this is my favorite part, thy pleasure, they are and were created. So what does all this mean? Well, you'll have to wait till March 20th, Bible study, to find out. Because next Wednesday night, we're doing a special study exposing cults, the occult. In case you know, there's a difference between a cult and the occult and false religions okay that'll be on march 6th and uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at yeah so then the, yes then on the uh on the on the 13th there'll be no bible study because we have a church board meeting uh and i do ask you guys to be praying for our church here uh that uh how the Lord would keep our doors open and pray for protection for us as Satan begins to throw a lot of darts at us here. Me personally, uh, a lot of spiritual warfare going on. And we and I need protection and provision. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot coming up. There's a lot of videos and a lot of charts and maps. And in the weeks to come, it's going to get really, really cool and intense. Uh... A lot of deep things, mind-blowing things, uh, as we really begin to see what's coming to planet Earth. Okay? Jesus reveals all of it, and it's going to be interesting. So let's bow our heads in the word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for uh, tonight, for this uh, uh, study. And as we prepare for the uh, weeks to come, pray for all those watching at home. Uh, you may bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you.